Let's come back to climate here for a better understanding of part one and how the correction of flawlessly erroneous climate analyses actually begins to play out. Part 3 is called climate coupling, because while the 200 plus papers I showed at the end of part 1 detail dozens of solar phenomena and earth climate characteristics, all solar climate forcing can be boiled down to just three categories of coupling. But first, what did I mean by flawlessly erroneous? What did I mean in part one when I said they weren't making mathematical errors or misrepresenting the consensus of their findings? In four simple lines, I can express the genuine concern communicated in part one. Their math was correct based on their starting information, and since they all had that same information and made no mathematical errors, their findings all agree. So no, I've read hundreds of their papers, and it's not their math that's wrong. It's what they started with. The fastest man on earth isn't going to win any races running in the wrong direction. Most of that starting information is flawed in the TSI model where the sun only varies its effect on earth via a 0.1% heating fluctuation on the stratosphere over time. In part one, we hope to explain how this was wildly under-inclusive of the forcing pathways known to exist and that during the most powerful solar events, the TSI model was falsely modulated down indicating in the data that we'd seen less solar energy during what were in fact the most powerful transfers to Earth. That's 140 years of solar flares and CMEs that show up in the data as negative temperature forcing from the sun, which leaves their real effect to be falsely applied to human activity. If you keep that natural variability small, like 0.1%, then the human changes are going to be huge. However, in the real world, all 100%, that's every last major solar event in the record, shows up as a drop in solar forcing and an increase in human forcing by definition. That is a problem. Consider this fact. Fact. From there, perfect math and conforming consensus result in what I call flawless error. When we showed just a handful of the confirmed future cooling factors and explained how each group found that their individual cooling discovery would not overcome global warming, I also made sure to tell you that their funding and their jobs required that narrow focus so you would see how flawlessly erroneous they had been. Alone? Maybe not. But what happens when you put all these together? You begin to run out of room for global warming. Now let's get to these types of coupling. This is where the error truly exists. In the starting information on solar variability, that TSI model really should not show just 0.1% variation with the CMEs and flares in there if they didn't drop the flux like a rock, which should cut back the human tally by a significant margin. The highest UV varies by at least 1% and the X-ray flux can vary by orders of magnitude. They just don't have their primary effect on the upper atmosphere. Solar flares, for example, have their primary ionization in the ionospheric layers of the planet. The next core error is in the restriction of that thermal coupling. About 30% of those cited papers from Part 1 relate to effects on major oscillations and circulations, semi-permanent pressure cells, and the upper jets. These have considerable effects on global temperature and precipitation, especially El Niño-La Niña, the NAO, and the annular modes, which all have positive relationships with solar activity. These effects are as slow-moving as the top-down stratospheric coupling, but they implicate a much broader forcing and modulation potential. But most importantly, the entirety of Chapter 5 in our book is about electromagnetic coupling. This would be cosmic ray cloud forcing, ionosphere modulation of surface pressure, and the rest of the total vertical atmospheric column effects that come with water vapor being vulnerable to electric current and magnetic fields. Vulnerable as in, able to be moved and excited. UV heating of the stratosphere takes a long time to come down, and oscillation modulation tends to be lagged by up to three years. But the ionosphere and magnetosphere have direct connections to the ground through the atmosphere at all times. And that is where the majority of space weather energy seeks Earth, either on the ionosphere, forcing by solar flares and CME impacts compressing the magnetosphere, or by the induction of that energy into the polar region Birkeland sheets. Again, all because there is a never-ending flow of current down in high pressure, up in low pressure, to the layers interacting with the electric field, charged particles, and high photon wave energy from space. So, for the record, the bottom two are entirely left out of climate models, 
and all that forcing gets added to human-caused totals. The top line is where the sun stands, and it too is a bit problematic since it fails to capture the key deliveries of energy from sun to earth, and in fact shows a decrease in solar energy delivered during those times, which is also improperly added to the human total. It comes down to a very simple equation. No wonder they made no mathematical errors. It is oversimplified, under-inclusive, Heck, half the story is missing. And not only missing, zero would be one thing, but it's not a zero sum on that one for the sun. It goes against it, and it improperly adds to the human-induced totals. These are facts.